A marauder born of the sea's tempestuous embrace. A Malma serpent rider whose eyes gleam with a mirthless grin, concealing a rage as boundless and as deep as the ocean itself. Welcome to Fudge Muppet, my name is Scott, and today I am thrilled to unveil a role-playing experience unlike any other, enriched and enlivened by carefully chosen mods. Behold, the Sea Elf build, the masterful serpent rider Saryoth, a Malma who once roamed the seas of Nern, crushing Ultima ships and pillaging trade vessels of the West. Astride his mighty beast, he would summon a magical melange of storm and snake venom as his serpent coiled from the waves and raked its teeth through splendor splintering wood and golden flesh. Prepare to embark on a journey into a brand new facet of Skyrim, where the echoes of Saryoroth's legacy await. Now without further delay, let's plunge into the depths of the backstory. His homeland was Pyandania, the mysterious realm of the Maoma, shrouded in an ethereal veil of perpetual mist, a labyrinth of secrets and ancient sorceries. Composed of low plateaus, the land was a viridian tapestry of lush jungles that cascaded into the ocean, unfurling into sprawling mangroves, sheltered sandbanks, and submerged kelp gardens that danced in the underwater currents. More than a mere haven for the sea elves, it was a sanctuary, an inviolable fortress that had never been conquered. The sporadic incursions of overzealous Ultima or the feeble machinations of some ambitious slowed or drag queen were nothing but the desperate clawing of outsiders against the unyielding majesty of Pyandania, forever the heart and stronghold of the Malma, their sacred exile. Saryoth hailed from an ancient clan, a lineage imbued with the lore and essence of Old Maris, bound by blood to the very cousin of their king Orgnum, who once stood defiant against the false rulers of an age long forgotten. His birthplace was a wonder to behold, one of the concealed pontoon cities of Pyandinia unseen by foreign eyes. Grand edifices of jungle wood stretched across lagoons and straits, tethered by an intricate web of ropes and pulleys to towering cliffs, where jungle snakes intertwined with railings and reef vipers danced upon the piers. Workers butchered great sharks and whales, with gulls and pelicans soaring in the sky above, waiting to feed upon the offcuts. Pagoda spires reached towards the heavens, anchored by elaborate chains. Atop them, Tempestari weaved their arcane mysteries, shaping the weather as they saw fit. The shipyards were ceaseless hives of activity, where ancient masters crafted fleets, and the skiffs and catamarans filled with sawtooth spearmen darted through the watery paths, each vessel carrying hunters eager to deliver their bounties of coral reef crustaceans and plentiful fish. Yet this daily spectacle, though mesmerizing, was but a part of life for the common Maoma. Saryoth's destiny was something grander, something noble. Born of an ancient and esteemed clan, his lineage was woven into the very fabric of Pyandinia's royalty. His family, stewards of a resplendent lagoon estate, had for millennia mastered the art of serpent taming, wielding their serpentine magic with deft skill and grace. Saryoroth's earliest memories were tender yet majestic, etched with the iridescent scales of sea serpent eggs, the pulse of the colours within, and the gentle caress of a serpent's head against his mother's hand. The connection between rider and serpent transcended mere companionship. It was an emotional symbiosis, a melding of minds, essential for their unity at sea. It is a bond so deep, so profound, that it becomes a dance of thought and emotion, a symphony of understanding. Saryoroth, chosen by blood and destiny, was to become a part of this ancient tradition, to embrace the legacy of his people, and to carve his name into the annals of Maoma history. As Saryoroth matured into adulthood, his mastery over sea serpent riding grew, and he became a prodigy, a figure of admiration and mystique among his clan. The bond with his powerful serpent transcended mere training. It was a connection of soul and essence, a dance of fluid grace and unspoken understanding. His fame spread beyond the shores of Pyandinia, as did tales of his encounters with the Thalmor at sea, where his serpent's fangs and his command of poison and storm magic left trails of ruin and awe in their wake. But Saryoth's destiny was to be shaped by events from the past. The War of the Isle, where King Orgnum was defeated and his legendary magical coffer of unlimited wealth was lost, had left deep scars in the fabric of Malma society. Discontent and resentment festered, creating rifts between clans and leading to the rise of rebellious factions. Whispers of displeasure grew louder, and soon they reached the ears of young Saryoroth. 
Among the malcontents were a group of Dagonite Malma pirates, followers of Mehrunes Dagon, the Daedric embodiment of change and revolution. Their insatiable lust for power and dominion knew no bounds, and they saw in King Orgrim's perceived weakness an opportunity to claim their destiny. In their secret gatherings they plotted, they conspired, their eyes set not only on the coasts of Tamriel for plunder, but eventually on the very throne of Pyandinia itself. Sayuroth's prowess had not gone unnoticed by these ambitious rebels. They sought him, they wooed him with promises of glory and liberation. The allure of the Dagonite ideology, the thrill of rebellion, and the intoxication of unchecked power began to gnaw at him. The whispers became a call, a siren song that pulled him towards a path uncharted. It was a fateful decision, one that would mark the beginning of a new chapter and the end of all he had known. Sayuroth abandoned his clan, his family, his heritage, and joined the ranks of the Dagonite pirates, taking with him his mighty serpent, the embodiment of his skill and legacy. Together with his new brethren, Sayuroth unleashed havoc upon the seas. His serpent's scales glistened in the sun as they raided and plundered, their venomous wrath leaving destruction in their wake. Years of raiding followed, with Sayuroth at the forefront, leading the pirates to victory after victory. His unique combination of magics, both poison and storm, were unmatched, and his serpent's horror was the substance of many a story and sea shanty in those days. They ravaged the coast of Hammerfell and High Rock, growing bolder and more ambitious with each successful raid. But ambition, like a storm, is a force that can blind and consume. Their eyes turned north, to the coasts of Skyrim, and then to a prize that promised riches and infamy, an imperial fleet protecting a galleon of the East Empire Company, its holds rich with ebony and Duema materials from Morrowind. A plan was hatched to take on the mighty Imperial fleet, a bold and perilous undertaking, one that would test the metal and resolve of the Dagonite Malma to their very limits. It was a battle like none before, a clash of power and magic, of harpoons and storms, of serpents and battle mages. The Dagonites fought with a ferocity driven by hubris, but they had underestimated their foes. In the midst of the chaos, Sayuroth fought with a desperation born of both fear and determination, but even his prodigious skill and the power of his serpent were not enough. The Imperial forces were relentless, their tactics precise, and their resolve unbreakable. Their ships were torn asunder, their serpents slain, and Sayuroth's beloved companion fell, its life extinguished by magic and steel. Its death was a blow that cut deeper than any wound, a loss that marked the end of all he knew. The battle was lost, the dream shattered, and Sayuroth, broken and bereft, was cast adrift. By a cruel twist of fate, or perhaps a final mercy, he survived, a shadow of his former self. His beloved serpent was dead, his allies vanquished, and his name a whisper of what could have been. When you embark on the journey of Sayuroth, you are immersing yourself in the echoes of a legend, a Malma pirate, a shadow of his former might. With the alternate start mod, you begin your odyssey as shipwrecked off the coast, marooned amidst the wreckage of a shattered vessel. The frigid embrace of Skyrim shores are far from the tropical Pyandinia, a harsh reminder of your fall from grace, a punishment perhaps for Sayuroth's overreach. Now, it does make the most sense that he would be immediately wearing the iconic C-scale Malma armor from the mod of the same name by Pulcharm Solus. You could just item code the gear with the console, or you could travel a short way to the Barnacle Boat, southeast of the wreck of the Brinehammer, and here you can loot the C-scale armor with both variants of the helmet and the Tide Serpent Sword. At the end of the day, as long as we start on the northern coast of Skyrim with a full set of gear, we are good to go. As a Malma, you are a rare sight in Tamriel, let alone Skyrim, and so most would treat you with suspicion at the least, so avoiding unnecessary interactions with citizens is advised, though perhaps they would just mistake you for an Ultima with some strange form of albinism. Skyrim's climate is a far cry from the tropical warmth of Pyandinia. Thematically, this feels as if it were hell for him, a grave punishment for his hubris, so you may think that he would seek to the warmer areas of the land, but no matter how cold, 
there is a comfort to be found in the coastal waters. And also there are a few things here of importance from a gameplay perspective. Your unique affinity for snake magic and storms makes the College of Winter hold an attractive path. The mages would welcome your exotic knowledge and in return offer magical resources to rebuild your arcane prowess. In gameplay terms, joining the College of Winterhold will give us access to a host of magical resources where we can begin to train up our skills and buy spell terms. Further east too is the Serpent Stone Isle, which is where we can get the aptly fitting serpent as our standing stone choice. I highly recommend these few moves to get ourselves established and from here how you can progress will obviously vary, but I will say while still in the northern reaches of Skyrim, when we approach the appropriate level we receive a letter about the museum opening in Dawnstar, and as it is about the mythic dawn of famed Meirun's Dagon cult, Saryoroth will be interested, and also this will take us on a quest to rebuild Meirun's Razor at the behest of Dagon, plus we can gain the Winter Sun mod's benefits from worshipping him. I will talk more about that later, but while we're in the role playing section, I do want to speak about some of the other options regarding the direction you can take him. I personally like to have an underdog, a rise from the ashes, continually ambitious Sayuroth, whose defeat at sea only emboldens him in time, especially as he becomes Meirun's champion. However, you can also play an alternative path where Sayuroth embraces a more redemptive arc, perhaps casting aside the ways of Dagon in favour of other gods and other ideals of a more heroic nature. This isn't how I play the character, but it's an option. I much prefer to play a rougher, more power-hungry build with this guy, motivated by his ability to exert his will. But assuming we stick to the Dagonite Sayaroth, then ambition is a core tenant of the character, whether that be in pursuits of magical mastery, acquisition of riches and artifacts, or the perfection of his skills. Ambition is the core driver. He constantly invokes the blessings of Dagon so that he may drive to mastery, always finding a bigger fish to fight and and many a big fish can be found in Skyrim. Throughout the main story, his dragonborn nature is revealed. Perhaps this in part was what gave him the prodigious skill at serpent riding. And he will face dragons, the serpents of the sky, including Alduin himself. Upon this path, he will eventually come to face Mirak upon Solstheim, and in the course of these trials, he will master the Bend Will Shout, allowing him to bring dragons to his will as he rides the Serpents of the Sky. Other shouts that thematically fit well are both Cyclone and Stormcall, but it's his magicka sourced abilities which really shine. As for factions, the Companions, Thieves Guild and Dark Brotherhood aren't really his cup of tea, nor is the Civil War. The Companions could be forced if he wanted to, perhaps in an endeavour to expand his martial skills, but petty thievery and devotion to a living corpse relaying kill orders isn't really a part of Sayuroth's ambition, nor this build's skill set. However, as part of his ambitious quest of self-mastery, there are many powerful individuals, both mortal and god, that can give him the experience, skills or artifacts that would help his cause. Daedric quests are great opportunities for acquiring new power, but your loyalty lies only with Dagon, and quests that advance your power are seen as a means to an end, so he can take advantage of and betray Daedra such as Azura for instance, especially when seeking to acquire the much more useful Black Star. Also, pirate themed quests such as the Lights Out quest where you help the Blackblood Marauders plunder the Ice Runner, and quests of other similar themes are a great fit for Sayuroth, a true Corsair at heart. Everything he does though, all this power, all this self-mastery, is done in the pursuit of a goal that he one day hopes to achieve. After he has become a demigod tier dragonborn, he will ride an army of dragons back to Pyandinia and depose King Orgnum, and use his power to bring a new order to the Maomar, one that will truly be successful at defeating the Ultima of Somerset, doing what King Orgnum for millennia could not. Sayuroth the Serpent Rider is a sea elf, which is a racial choice we can make with the Sea Elf Races mod by Murden, link in the description. It comes with various sub-race choices, but I just went with a common sea elf, and functionally the sea elf race gains the advantage of 50% storm resistance. For the Standing Stone option, we are going with the Serpent Stone, and with the Even Star Standing Stone mod by Anation, it offers us the Star Curse, which we can use against our enemy, reducing their armor by 100 points and causing a 50% weakness to poison, which fits nicely with our 
array of poison based spells. Also with the Winter Sun mod we can choose to worship a deity and I highly recommend as per the backstory selecting Mehrunes Dagon. His shrine blessing increases destruction spells effectiveness by 10% which is handy for us and as a follower we can use self immolation. Daedric fire burns your spirit as you pray, draining magicka. Stop praying at 20% or less to gain more favour and burning path activations and as a devotee nearby foes burn for X damage and explode on death for X damage based on favour with Mehrunes Dagon. Which is a neat little power to have, but worshipping Dagon really is for the roleplaying flavour with this build. To gain favour with Dagon, slay people who stand in your way, defile the shrines of my enemies, those skilled in destruction are the most deserving of my favour. And finally, for the stat spread, we're going to go with a pretty even split of magicka and health, forgetting about stamina entirely. A large magicka pool, even with enchanting boosts, is very useful for this build, as we are slinging spells constantly. But now let's get into all the skills and perks. The Sea Elf skills are Destruction, Restoration, Alteration, Enchanting, Light Armor, and One Handed. I'm going to list all the perks on screen and I will specifically talk about the most essential and gameplay changing ones as I go through each skill. Firstly, Destruction is our primary skill. It is our bread and butter, our rain and thunder. This is our main damage dealer. We use this skill to call down thunderous magics and storms upon our enemies and some of the perks that come along with the Valkyrie skill tree overhaul by Inacion gives us some really great elemental specific bonuses. For starters, we're going to want to get the classic destruction dual casting and impact perks so that our dual cast spells stagger opponents, just a destruction mage essential. And we're diving into the shock element tree, picking up perks like augmented shock, which boosts our shock damage by 40% at two ranks. And with a deafening shock perk, shock spells have a 20% chance to silence targets for two seconds, meaning that they can't cast spells. Great for pesky ward shielding mages and also with crackling sphere, Shock spells have 20% chance to levitate targets for 2 seconds, and on top of that the Hellstorm perk makes it so that levitating enemies take an additional 50% more damage. Lots of additional crowd control options here, and when paired with Chain Lightning it can really help you dominate large groups, but that isn't all. We take the Helloth's Disjunction perk, which makes it so opponents affected by Destruction spell cloaks gain a 25% weakness to that element. And as you can see we are almost always using a Lightning Cloak, so that means enemies in proximity are going to to cop some serious damage. We also get Elemental Shield, which makes it so our Lightning Cloak grants an extra 50% resistance to Lightning, which stacked with our innate Storm resistance of 50% maxes that out. Restoration is another important skill and of course it has its usual utility with its healing applications but more importantly for this build we optimize for the use of poison spells. Harm is a perk which makes it so casting healing spells on an enemy actually does 35% of the healing amount in damage. So when we use grand healing which heals us for 200 points the area effect healing converts to area effect damage at 35% meaning 70 points of damage against enemies in proximity as you heal which is pretty awesome. Awesome. This also stacks with Eternal Flame, which makes healing spells linger, which heals the original amount again, 200 with grand healing, but over the course of 20 seconds. Corrupting Poison at two ranks makes it so enemies with immunity to poison actually still take 50% damage instead, and Slow Death makes it so poison spells last twice as long on enemies. So between poison spells, healing spells, which cause damage, and the Lightning Cloak boosted by destruction, we have heaps of residual damage on enemies in proximity slowly dying to a crackling storm of venom. Alteration is the next magic skill and it with the Odin Magic Overhaul mod by Anation has some really awesome utility such as Slowfall, Rainos Fins and League Step but we'll talk about the magic later. As for perks, Akato's preparation makes it so that when we enter combat it automatically activates for no magic cost the most effective armor spell you know. So we will be easy getting an Ebony Flesh boost or Dragonhide boost if you have done the Alteration Master quest for zero magicka when we enter battle. And a massive game changer for this build is the perk Ritualist, which makes it so that any two-handed master spell can be cast while moving, but the strength of the spell is reduced by 25%. However, this is a very worthwhile trade-off. We use it primarily for the Master Spells, Lightning Storm and Lightning Fury, so we can run around firing a Death Laser or calling the storms down upon our enemies. Other applications include Poison Nova and even Mass Paralysis. Also, we can go for Magic Resistance 3 out of 3, giving 30% Magic Resistance, as well as Atronarch, giving 30% Spell Absorption. Alter Self is also a perk which we can use to increase an attribute by 25 points and two resistances by 25%, of which I chose Frost and Fire Resistance, 
resistance as we are already more than covered for shock resistance and I increase Magicka for the attribute boost. Enchanting, you probably know the usual story if you've watched Fudge Mapper builds before, but basically we take a straight line through armor and regalia enchanter through to extra effect so we can drop two enchantments on one piece. The one-handed skill is essentially for our backup Tide Serpent Sword, just a very little investment of three perks so we can get up to decapitations. And Light Armor has a variety of perks which A, help us be protected more and B, make us move faster. Tough Hide is a cool perk and thematically suits us giving 40% resistance to disease and poison. Windrunner gives us 10% additional movement speed in a boost. And with Untouchable, we get an extra 15% move speed in combat on top of that, but the effect disables for 10 seconds if we take an unblocked hit. But that is all for the perks and skills. Again, reference the perk list for more information. Time to jump into gear, weapons, and items and such. The amazing mod by Pulcharm Solus has provided us with the Sea Scale Armor and Tide Serpent Sword. I mentioned before how to get it, but the armor does come with two variants of the Sea Scale Helmet. But to be honest, I love both, so I couldn't decide which to use. And so I made it so that we use both, utilizing different sets of enchantments. The Tide Serpent Sword is straightforward. I didn't even bother enchanting it because sometimes I just can't be bothered with the hassle of recharging it all the time and it's also just a secondary backup for the most part. But the armor will all be enchanted. Firstly I get a necklace, you can use any, can't see it on the character anyway so it doesn't matter from an aesthetic perspective. I named mine the Pyandinian Amulet and it is enchanted with Alteration and Restoration Cost Reduction. The armor piece is enchanted with Destruction and Restoration Cost Reduction. The boots are enchanted with One Handed Damage and Frost Resistance because getting slowed by Frost sucks. The gauntlets also have have one-handed damage and a magical pool increase. For the helmets, one I enchant with destruction cost reduction and restoration cost reduction. I chose the variant with the little fish face for that one. And for the other one, I chose destruction and alteration reduction. So you can swap to whichever helmet depending on whether you are preferring restoration or alteration spells for that battle. But consider that at max enchanting skill and with an enchanter's elixir, any of our spells will have in the area of 60% cost reduction with our destruction spells in the ballpark of 90% cost reduction. And depending on which helmet you have equipped at the time, alteration or restoration will be at 90% reduction. Now, you can obviously abuse enchanting further and make it so destruction spells cost nothing, but it does feel way more hacky to me that way. And as you can see, the gameplay on Master Difficulty and with the amount of magicka we have, it just isn't necessary to reduce the cost to zero. But ultimately, it's up to you. However, do consider on lower levels of cost reduction and before you get extra effect, as you go throughout the game, you probably want to emphasize destruction cost reduction over all others. But let's now dive into the spells and shouts. Do note that some of these are vanilla, but many are from Anation's Odin Magic Overhaul mod. First, shouts. I've mentioned before that Bendwill, Stormcall, Cyclone, and perhaps even things like Elemental Fury are a good thematic fit. However, the magic is just way cooler for the most part. So let's break all that down by school. With Destruction, our main spells will be Chain Lightning, which gives us some good crowd damage as it connects to nearby enemies. Plus it can stagger when dual cast because of the impact perk. We also have Lightning Grasp, which is like a close combat proximity shock damage spell that is continually casted. We have the Lightning Storm Master spell, which unleashes a constant stream of death laser tier lightning. And thanks to the Ritualist Alteration perk, we can actually move as we cast this spell. It's pretty god tier. But my favorite part of the destruction spells here is Lightning Fury, which fits the theme of a storm calling sea elf perfectly. Again, we can move while using it because of Ritualist, and it calls down lightning from the sky, eviscerating your enemies. You've seen me use it many times by now. Lightning Cloak is also used most of the time, which gives off passive shock damage to nearby enemies with various boosts because of our perks, but we hardly ever actually have to cast it because of an alteration spell which I'll talk about in a second. For alteration spells, the ones that get used the most are some of the fun movement utility types, such as League Step, which increases sprint speed dramatically and reduces the stamina cost of sprinting, Rainos Fins, which increases our swim speed, which makes sense for our Sea of character, and Slow Fall, which does as it says, makes us slowly fall from heights, but also take no damage, which is just such a cool spell and very handy for traversal. Akato's Spell Trigger is a spell that allows us to store a self-cast spell in our left hand so that it triggers automatically when we enter battle. In this case, we use it to store Lightning Cloak so that when we enter battle, Lightning Cloak automatically casts along with Ebony Flesh or Dragonhide from the Akato's preparation perk. 
There is also Dire Corrosion, which makes targets lose 250 points of armor and 30% attack damage for 30 seconds, and Dire Vulnerability, which makes targets 50% weaker to elemental and poison damage for 30 seconds. Both are very useful for weakening sturdier targets. Restoration spells include Grand Healing, so we can heal ourselves to 200 points, plus damage nearby enemies for 70 points, as per the aforementioned harm perk in the Restoration Tree. Outside of that, we use poison spells such as Viper Bolt, Viper Blast, or Toxic Cloud, or variations of poison damage spells, but my favorite is Poison Nova, a master spell that does 15 points of poison damage a second for 30 seconds, great to drop in the middle of an enemy group, and then we use our superior speed to evade and watch them whittle away from the poisoning and shock damage from our cloak. Also, Poison Strikes is a cool spell to use with our sword. When cast, it makes power attacks inflict poison, 5 damage per second for 20 seconds, good to use when falling low on Magicka and are about to resort to the sword. Do note, remember that because of our perks, all all those poison spells durations are doubled. So now we know all the perks, skills, spells, shouts, gear, and the like, time to see how it all culminates in a playstyle. Now, as you've seen, there is a ton of variety that is possible with all the various spells, but I'll break down more or less how I play it. Before the battle, I make sure to have used Okato's spell trigger recently enough so that the lightning cloak is stored and ready to go, and I usually try to have Slowfall and League Step cast recently so I can have that enhanced mobility, and once we enter battle, Okato's preparation perk should activate Dragonhide or Ebony Flesh, as I had in this footage because I hadn't yet on the master quest to get Dragonhide. Okato's spell trigger will cast Lightning Cloak for free, and often then I like to start off by positioning myself for a Poison Nova so that poison spells will start their effects, or maybe I hit my enemies with a Dire Vulnerability or Dire Corrosion first, but really, after that, it's all about unleashing destruction magic at will, playing around with all the offensive spells we have at our disposal. And if we're ever in trouble, just cast Grand Healing, and we both heal ourselves and damage enemies in proximity. At higher levels, especially, this build is a vicious powerhouse of Storm and Venom. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that's everything you need to know about the Serpent Rider build, Sayuroth the Sea Elf. Again, I want to thank all the wonderful modders out there for continually improving the game, keeping it fresh, whether that be new gameplay or new aesthetics for role-playing. Shout out again to Pool Charm Solace for the incredible Sea Scale Malma armor and all the other amazing lore-focused armor mods. Please do give the video a like if you enjoyed the video. My name is Scott from Fudge Muppet, and do be sure to subscribe, especially if you are looking forward to Starfield, because we're super excited to have a fresh new Bethesda game to dive in and create builds for. It's so close now. Anyways, thanks again for watching. I'll be back to nerd out with you again soon.